Well, good evening, uh, Woodstock Church family. Uh, I'm thankful to be here with you. <laughs> I appreciate the um, the opportunity to, to speak. Um, I hate that it's so estranged and I don't get to see your faces, but it is what it is. Um, for those of you who do not know who I am, I'm Jake Sutton. Uh, I am from Adairsville, Georgia, uh, but I labor, preach, pulpit minister here uh, at the Piedmont Road Church of Christ. I think... Um, I believe the last time I was in your building uh, was 2012. Uh, I was raising support to go to the Memphis School of Preaching, and who would have thought that uh, it would have come full circle that I'd have been back down here in this area? Uh, Goodness, Um, well, (laughs) seven, eight years later. Um, But I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate this topic that we have, uh, a very needful topic, uh, a very sensitive topic, um, to talk about things that, that we don't usually talk about, that you don't necessarily find a whole lot of um, brotherhood material or conversation. This is one of those um, topics that we, we shy away from. Uh, it's an awkward conversation, but you know the devil's not scared of an awkward conversation. Uh, we, we try to protect our children. I've got a four-year-old, and I... I dread those conversations that have to be had in some ways, but in some ways I don't because I want to raise a a f- strong, faithful young man in the faith. Um, and if I don't have those conversations with my child, if I don't have those conversations with my teenager, uh, if we don't have our, those conversations with one another, then um, the devil will have conversation. He will have his day. Um, we shush stuff like this from... Uh, maybe public view, we're very prudish people, we're very private people, and this is one of those ugly sins that uh, a lot of the world can't get over, and we just, um, if we're not careful, we will avoid uh, dealing with this. Uh, But if we're going to be faithful to the truth, which I know you as the church at Woodstock are, we're going to uphold all things, and we're going to be balanced, and we're going to be fair uh, as we are here at Piedmont Road. Uh, My topic... um, sins of the flesh um, mine is adultery and fornication Um, sexually immoral is the word and that's where something is immoral uh, for sexual reasons Uh, it goes against the grain of God it goes against the pattern of God and so that's going to be our topic tonight but before we get into that uh, let's have a word of prayer and um and uh, ask the Lord to bless what we're doing and uh, give him thanks. So if you don't mind, pray with me. Father, without your revelation, we are helpless. We are lost. We are damned. We are left ignorant. We are left to live this life by ourselves. We are left to wander aimlessly in the dark. But Father, in your grace, you have stooped down and given us this word, this revelation, this mystery that was hid in ages past, that salvation is for all people through your Son. Father, we pray that I would speak in such a way that would be beneficial for all hearers, that would be in taste, Uh, but Father, that would be truthful. Father, we pray for the hearers those listening, that they would hear as they should hear. Father, we pray that all hindrances would be removed and all things that would keep us from growing in this grace and knowledge. Father, we're so thankful for Jesus and for his um, sacrifice, and we're thankful for the appeasement that it brought that we can pray at a moment's notice. Father, we're thankful for your Spirit who has revealed all these things through your Word We're thankful that he is doing his work in our life, that he is um, continuing to sanctify us and to cleanse us and to purify us before you as your son is sanctified. Father, we give you this prayer. It's through Christ that we pray. Amen. If we were to define our terms Biblically speaking, um, adultery is sexual relationship outside of the marriage covenant. 
it's had by those who are bound by a marriage covenant. And it's a covenant because it's a, it's a promise that you have made before God, and God is serious about your vow. Adultery is when one of the parties, or both, uh, leaves the marriage bed and defiles it. Uh, the marriage bed is undefiled, but they leave that realm for various reasons uh, and commit such an act. And they, they break the bond. They uh, break the covenant between the two of them. Uh, every marriage can be saved. If you're watching this and you have committed such a thing, or maybe you're in a, you're going through um, the effects of such a thing. Uh, just know that there's grace. Just know that there is a peace that can come. Uh, God can fix every marriage. If two people will be Jesus in a relationship, nothing can stop that. Uh, no amount of evil or sin that you or I have done um, can thwart or end God's goodwill and God's purpose for our life. Adultery. Sexual relationship by a married person outside of the marriage vow. Fornication, sex outside of marriage, um, one who is single. Uh, this fits into the realm of the word is pornea. Uh, it's where we get our word pornography. Uh, pornography isn't fornication itself. Fornication is the overt act of sex outside of what God has deemed to be um, uh, acceptable, pleasing in His sight, beautiful in His sight. God has defined marriage. God has defined sex. God has defined it in its proper place. But fornication is when a single person has it outside of what God has said um, to do, to be in, and whatnot. We, we can't help but get into the heart of the matter. Um, as we said, sexually immoral, where that's kind of an umbrella term, where you know pornography and fornication and adultery all uh, fit in fit under that realm, if you will. Uh, but they're very three very distinct, different acts. I want you to understand that Jesus is not okay uh, with any of those things, obviously. But Jesus is not okay with a world that does not behave uh, that way. Jesus isn't just okay when there's a world that doesn't have adultery in it. Um, there's more to the Christian lifestyle than not doing something or abstaining from something. If we're not careful in the kingdom of God, we can, we can be so much don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do that we forget who we are and what we're for. Uh, and the world sees us for what we're not for and not for what we are for. Probably because we're not promoting what we are for. Uh, if we're not careful, we'll draw lines in the sand and say, well, we're not going to do that and we're not going to do that and we're not going to do that. Rightfully so, but we'll be unbalanced in it. Um, it's easy for us to call out uh, the homosexual agenda. It's easy for us to call out um, a baby born out of wedlock. It's easy for us to, to string up, if you will, people who, who are mingled in homosexuality, but we don't talk about as much as those who uh, commit adultery, or we don't talk about the situation of those in divorced marriages. Um, that, that happens across the brotherhood. We will view one sin worse than the other. Uh, yes, the effects are different of the sin, but the, sin, the end result is the same. And what I want to bring to your attention in Matthew chapter 5, uh, Jesus is, just, is not okay with just behavior alone. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 27, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus just isn't okay with Jake. You can think what you want to think, and you, you can uh, replay old habits in your mind as long as you don't act on those things. I've heard people say, well, pornography is okay because I'm not acting on it. I'm not, I'm not cheating. Well, at least I'm not cheating. At least I've not left my wife. No, you have. You have. You've left her in your heart. Verse 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than 
your whole body go into hell, that awful place, place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. And, and you notice that Jesus is talking about lust in the heart, and he talks about the right eye and the right hand, meaning what you see, what you give your authority to, the right hand or right eye, um, depic depicted uh, a sense of authority all throughout Scripture. And so what you're saying is, is that I'm giving my heart the authority to do uh, what my physical body won't. So right eye, right hand, is Jesus talking about sexual pleasure? Is Jesus talking about viewing pornography? Is he talking about that? M maybe, maybe. Uh, I, I know that pornography, quote, as we have it today, was not as accessible then, uh, but, but keep in mind they had it. This is no new agenda. This is no new thing. Um, but Jesus just isn't okay with Jake. As long as you don't cheat, that's all right. As long as you don't go into that, as long as you don't commit that act, you're okay. Jesus says don't even have it in your heart. The heart is the problem. Jesus uses the word hell here. These effects of lust in the heart, and this is where it begins. You don't magically wake up one day in somebody else's bed. You don't, you don't magically um, walk into a situation and leave a situation and the world has forever changed. It begins in your heart. And Jesus says these deadly effects in your heart will cause you to lose your soul to hell. The word desire is, or lust, is not a bad word in and of itself. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus said, I desire that I eat this Passover meal with you. So the idea of desire or lust isn't necessarily a bad thing. But if it is, if we put a definition on this, if we put a definition on the term of lust, it's the idea, a desire that we should not have because it goes against the glory of Christ. It takes God off of his pedestal. It takes Jesus off of his uh, work, what he has done, and we have replaced ourselves and our heart in the midst of that. What I want to do is something beneficial. I don't want to just preach, preach, preach. I don't want to just say, don't do, don't do, don't do. We can do the church in a serious injustice if we as those who preach or teach say, don't do, don't do, don't do. What I'd like to do this evening for you is to give you a, a, a battle plan, if you will. Uh, I want to give you a, a method or a system. When sexual temptation comes, and rest assured, it will show its ugly head. Uh, for every single person, it will show up in some way, some shape, some form. Uh, I almost wore a black shirt and a red jacket <laughs> to say, you know, you wish the devil would show up like this every time that you had a temptation because it would be easily seen. Um, but that's not how he works. You know as well as I know, ladies, you have a hard time at home. Your husband doesn't listen. And though you confide in a person at work and you have an emotional affair and that emotional affair leads to the bedroom, or if you're not married, that leads to fornication. There's a, this is science now, and this is free for nothing, okay? But if you don't want to slip, don't go where it's slippery. That's, that's the truth. If you don't want to slip, don't go where it's slippery. You know whether or not uh, something is going to lead you into a bad situation. We're not oblivious. We're not ignorant. So what I want to do is give us a, a, um, an acronym, if you will, uh, to, to war through this, because it is a war. We have to understand that. This is something that is warring for my very soul. And to lust and to, de and to desire something other than Jesus Christ and His will for my life is spiritual adultery. And I don't want to get into that. I don't want to get near that, and you don't either. So the word is anthem, A-N-T-H-E-M. And so I'm going to go through this word and give you something for each one. So number a, I guess, letter A, in the word of anthem, in the word anthem, A, avoid. Avoid. When Jesus saw people chastising him privately, or he saw people having conversations, uh, religious conversations that did nothing, did nothing good, nothing beneficial, and all they did was stir up wrath and trouble. And we have people like this in the Brotherhood today. Uh, Jesus says, just let them alone. Just leave them alone. Avoid. As much as possible, avoid these type of situations. Avoid avenues. The proverb writer is slap full of 
Son, don't even go down that street. She's out there. She's hanging out that door like a leech. <laughs> don't go down there. She's a parasite, and she will, she will uh, rib the life out of you. Avoid. Avoid as much as possible and resonate the sights and situations that arouse unfitting desire. I say as possible. You can't help what somebody wears. You can't help what you see all the time. Um, dear brother, good friend, John Podine, he was youth minister in North Georgia for a couple of years when I was in, I think I just graduated high school. And he said something to us that just made a whole lot of sense. He said, fellas, it's not the first look that gets you, it's the second. When you see somebody come in, men, women, both applies, and they appear desirable, or maybe they're wearing something that is leading you down a road of immodesty, and it's their fault, and they have a part in what you do, no doubt. It's not the first look, it's the second. Avoid that, and I say avoid unfitting desire, because not all desire is bad. We are to have good desire. We are to have a, a physical flesh desire for our spouse. That's, that's something that God has put in us. Malachi 2.15, God desires offspring, in particular godly offspring. Well, there's only one way that that's going to happen. The Lord knows that. And so the union between a husband and wife is a beautiful, sanctioned union that's blessed. We have to be careful. We talk, about, we talk about sex outside of marriage being sinful. or We talk about sex uh, in adultery being sinful. But brethren, if we're not at home taking care of our home, if we're not in our homes and we're not taking care of each other in a physical, intimate, sexual way, that's just as wrong. That's just as sin. We can point the fingers and say, oh, look, I'm the reprobates acting like heathen in the world outside of marriage. But if our homes are not sexually taken care of and we willfully disregard that fact and need of our spouse, then we have a problem. We are to desire that. We are to have that, that affection. That's something that's a beautiful union between a husband and a wife. If you've got young children in the room, how do you explain that to them? Mamas and daddies are mamas and daddies. Daddy is for mama, mama is for daddy. We have to have those kind of conversations because our children are going to see more and more and more of a polluted, poisoned lifestyle of marriage. Avoiding is a biblical strategy. If we go all the way back to Joseph, Joseph ran, bless his heart. He just ran, and he was more scared of offending God than he was of picking up his own cloak and looking like he'd left the scene of the crime. He was more afraid of the wrath of his Lord, and he was more afraid of, of, of outraging his God and getting involved in that situation. You know why he ran? Because it was a temptation. If it wasn't a temptation for him, he would have just said, no, thank you, grabbed his clothes and, and walked out the room. But it was a problem. It was something that was a desire that he knew it was a desire. She knew it was a desire. God did. Satan did. And, and there you have that battle, and he runs. Why did he run? Because it was a temptation. Avoiding this, pa this passion. I want you to open your Bible to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we'll start in verse 19. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal this stamp of approval. The Lord knows them who are His, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master, of the house ready for every good work. Don't that don't you want that to be you? Well, yeah. So, verse 22, flee, avoid, run away from youthful passions and pursue righteousness. Don't just don't the Lord, you're going to see a couple of scriptures in here today. The Lord doesn't just say don't do something, but he says do something. 
So not only does he have a no, but he also has a yes. Don't do the youthful passions, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along those with, who call on the name of the Lord. Here it is again, from a pure heart. It, it all stems from the heart. Adultery, fornication, pornography, any of that, self-pleasure, all stems from the heart. Where we say, I know what God says, but I don't care. Avoid that situation. Next, in. A N. The word is no. Every time a sinful situation does show up and you did your best to avoid it but you couldn't help it, you need to have a, whether that be an audible <laughs> or whether that be a mental, no. You got about five seconds to say no. You got about five seconds to get it out of your mind. The longer you allow sin to stay, the harder it is for you allow to spirit, the, the Spirit of God to slay it. The longer you allow sin to seep and to sop like a, like a biscuit and gravy, the harder it is it will be for you to let it go. Let it go. The word is no. I want you to imagine that we're walking down a trail and, and I throw, I see a snake, a rattlesnake, by, mind you. I pick up this rattlesnake by the tail and sling it at your head. Now what are you going to do? You're not going to entertain it. You're not going to grab it. You're not going to let it fall on your neck. You know better. You know what it's for. You know where it will lead. It is undesirable, and the results are potential death. Why do we play around with the fire of passion? Why do we, why do we play around with that old fruit of deceit that the devil is still in the business of pre presenting in front of us? Why do we do that? because it's desirable, because it's we cope. It's because, well, I think I deserve this. I've done my best. My spouse is withholding from me. I need, I, I need help. I, I, I need some relief. And it's just, it's, it'll just be a couple of times. It won't be nothing serious. The word is no. Some Alaskan hunters, they kill wolves this way. Native Americans, they take a blade. They would take a blade and they would dip it in blood and it would be freezing cold and they would they would put that that knife hilt in the ground and, and that blade would be frozen and a wolf would smell the blood and come by and, and begin to lick that blade and while he's licking that blade at first he tastes the that ice and that blood but but as you know as he licks this knife he begins to cut his own tongue and by cutting his own tongue he He's tasting his own blood, and he bleeds out and dies right by that knife. How, how, long do we, how long do we entertain the idea of sin? We don't. It enters into my mind. I cannot help a temptation. I am tempted. So are you in various different ways. You can't help that necessarily. You avoid it as best as you can, but then when it does show its ugly face, you have a no in mind. You, you scream it if you have to. You run away. Avoid it, Joseph. John Owen said, by killing sin, or be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. Romans chapter 8 and verse 13, Paul said, if you live by the flesh, you will die. You will die. But if you, by the Spirit, put to death the, the sin, or what easily besets us, Romans or the Hebrews writer says, you will live. If you will slay your sin, you will live. You have a part in this lot to actively pursue righteousness, to consciously put away from, so A, avoid, N, no. Number next, T, A-N-T. Turn the mind willfully and forcefully to Jesus as a superior satisfaction. Just saying no is not good enough. Just walking around saying, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do. Number one, it's not biblical. Jesus doesn't command that alone. I do have to put off and to put on. I do have to kill that sin. And that's something that I have to kill every day, and so do you. We have to put to death those things that would reign our soul and cost us our soul. Turn the mind. You've got to fight fire with fire. 
Satan has his promises. Christ has his promises. Which one will you believe? When you sin and when I sin, what we're doing is, is we're believing the lies of Satan rather than trusting the promises of God. That's why we do what we do. For just a moment, for a brief moment, or for some people, for a lifetime, they take a promise of Satan and, and it's promising such a wonderful thing. It's promising such a fix. But if you're watching this and you have ever committed fornication or adultery, you know it did not fix the problem. It did not mend things. It did not make you feel better. It was a lie. The Bible calls the Bible calls it deceitful desires. Flip over to Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do. In the futility of their mind, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. So why are they outside? Because their heart's hardened. Who did that? They did. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greed, to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to you, to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And so the, the, the promise of the new life and the, the call of the new life is verse 23, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So not only do we turn away from the old lifestyle, the old ways, but we turn to the promises of God in Jesus Christ. There is a lie that says you need this. There is a lie that says, you know what, your spouse isn't doing what they need to be doing. Or maybe it's the case your spouse is sick and they can't physically operate in that manner. And you say in your mind, you know what, I deserve better. You know what, I deserve to be happy. Realistically, we don't. Realistically, we deserve death, but, but, but God through Christ has given us victory and given us grace. Where do we get this sense of entitlement that I have to be fulfilled? I know where we get it. I know where we get it. And it's not from God. Brethren, let me, let me reverently remind you that our Lord remained pure his entire life. So when Satan wants to tell me and to tell you, you need sex. Oh, you need it. You need this fix. No, you don't. The Lord didn't need it. And he was a man. And he was a man. Let's not forget that, brethren. He was tempted in all points like as we are. He was a man. It's by speculation that they say when they threw the the woman caught in the act of adultery. When they threw her at Jesus' feet, if she was caught in the very act, as the text said, some have the opinion to say she may have been nude. That if she was caught in the act and they threw her at Jesus' feet, maybe he bent down and stooped to look away from the woman. Oh, we don't know. It's just speculation. But our Lord was a man who had physical need and physical desire. So the next time I feel vindicated or wronged and my spouse turns me down, I need to remind myself, Jake, the Lord didn't pursue this. Don't you either. Turn away from that. Deceit is defeated by truth. We have to fight fire with fire. I have to remind myself, I've got to pick up my Bible. I've got to go through the Psalms, especially the Proverbs, and see what wisdom is really all about. And it's not about what you and I may often think. The heart is a wicked, wicked thing. And I need Jesus to give me a new heart. Brethren, ignorance is not bliss. The truth will stand when the world's on fire. 
I trust that you know that. There is a psalm, a particular psalm, that is on a wool banner in my office, and I keep it there. And the first thing I see every morning that I walk into this office is this verse, and I want to share it with you. Psalm 16 and verse 11. If this is not true, I don't know what is. And if I don't hold to this, and if you don't hold to this, brethren, then why, pray tell me, why in the world are we doing what we do? This is the hub of why we do what we do. This is why you're watching me. This is why I'm talking to a piece of a piece of glass and metal and some kind of foreign object that, that's hoodoo and voodoo and takes my picture elsewhere. You know why you're doing that? Because of this verse right here. Psalm 16 and verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Christ is more pleasurable. God is more um, right. God is more pleasing. Either I believe this verse or I don't. The psalmist said, Your steadfast love, O Lord, is better than life. Now, I either believe that or I don't. I'm either a part of God's fold and the righteous of God or, or I'm not. And, and for those of you who are on the fence and struggling with this, initially I want to say thank God that you struggle because there is still some good thought in you. There is still scripture in your mind warring against this, this fleshly world. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. Where is my utmost joy? Where will I find the fullness of joy? Where will I find these pleasures that never go away? In the presence of God. In the path of righteousness. Nowhere else. Nowhere else. If I look to my wife as sweet and as beautiful and as, as, as lovely as she is, and if I look to that woman to try to justify, or if I look to her to try to um, build me up, if I look to her as though she is God, and I'm looking to her for, for satisfaction, I'm looking for her for justification, I will be let down in life. She is not God, and she will not provide for me pleasures forevermore. I love her, and I'll die by her. But she is not God. When you and I look to one another, when you look to your spouse to fulfill your pleasures forevermore, you've taken God off of his seat and put her or him. God forbid that. A N T H is the next one. H. Hold, <laughs> hold the promise and the pleasure of Christ. Hold it. I've heard some people saying, I've sat across from them from a desk, and I've heard people say, well, I tried that. I tried doing that, but it just didn't work. You want to tell me God's system is busted and broken? How long did you try for? How long did you stay in it? When you committed, you committed. There was no, there was no way of escape out of it. There's no back plan. There's no, there's no backups. There's no do-overs. The verse of old, Jesus, we, we read it at first, Matthew 5 and verse 37, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit adultery. Okay, I, I understand that. I understand that. That verse was written not just for me as a husband, not just for my wife, not just for God's sake, but for my child's sake. I got a four-year-old. And you know what he loves? He loves the fact that there is mama and daddy with him every day. There is a stability in his mind and in his heart because mama and daddy have committed and continue to commit. Not, not good on us, but good on God. Because 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11, this is God's glory. If we do anything in God's name, if we, if we do any kind of good in life, it's by the grace of God and he gets the glory. If we say, oh, look at us, how great, look how long we've made it and look what we've done. No, God saves the marriage or nobody does. My child needs to see that. You shall not commit adultery is for children. You know who suffers the most in a divorce? Children. Babies. Pure, innocent children who did no, who did no wrong to, justi to, to justify any kind, of, any kind of punishment from your actions. Our homes are busted. Even within the church. Uh, 
I don't want to get too much into statistics because I value a soul more than I do statistics, but statistics don't lie necessarily. But there's a reason that people are acting the way that they act. There's a reason that people do what they do. Yes, I know they're in control. Yes, I know they're in charge. Yes, I know they're accountable. But the environment that you and I raise our children in as, as parents, brethren, let me remind you, you've got about seven years to mold that child the first seven years of their life. You've got about seven years to mold that child into the grace and gospel of Jesus. After that, they become their own, psychologists say. You've got to hold on to this. Hebrews chapter 12. Here are people who are wanting to leave Christianity and go back into Judaism, persecuted on all fronts, religiously speaking, uh, physically speaking, spiritually speaking is the term, actually. Hebrews chapter 12. And, and this writer has to, has, has to remind them why they did what they did in the first place. And if you're struggling, you're teeter-totting on the fence of whether should I continue this relationship through text message. If I'm having to delete text messages so my wife or my husband won't see it, I'm in the wrong. My heart's broken, busted. I need to repent and pray God. You need to get somebody to hold you accountable. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, Therefore, since we are so surrounded by such a great a cloud of witnesses, let us uh, cast aside, lay, throw away every weight and sin which so clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before him. Verse 2, looking to Jesus. The reason you commit adultery, the reason that you fornicate, and the reason that you view pornography is because you've taken your eyes off of Jesus. The reason you do that is because you've taken your eyes off of Jesus. That's the reason. You know, there's an old saying, you, you can't cast stones when you're washing feet. Well, you can't commit adultery when you're looking at the Savior. You cannot. For folks that say, I tried, it don't work. Imagine it's the case that your garage door, that old electric garage door is closing and your child is laying unconscious. And if this garage door closes, it will kill your child. And you th run and throw yourself under that door. And you uphold that door. And you're screaming for help and for help and for help. How long would you hold that door up? Maybe it's not your child. Maybe it's somebody else's child. How long would you hold up that door? How long would you endure? I have no doubt you would stand there and do that until your, bodily, your body gave out and you passed out. I have no doubt. You would die for that child. But brethren, when we refuse to hold up our desires when we refuse to hold up the promises of Jesus and we give way to sin and we stop looking at Jesus verse 3 of Hebrews 12 we stop considering Jesus he did not hold he did not hold up on his end of the bargain he didn't pump the brakes and say, well, you know what? I've reconsidered. I just don't feel the way that I feel anymore. I'm just out of love, and so we just need to part ways. I'm thankful he didn't do that to me. Brethren, the mind is a muscle, and we have to vehemently flex that muscle and work out those dark thoughts that Satan wants to throw into your mind and, and, and take you down a road that right now you may want to go. Or you like to flirt with. But your children are laying there. And they're watching. You've got to fight. You're going to fight in a marriage. You might as well fight for what's right. E-A-N-T-H-E. -E, enjoy Christ as the superior satisfaction. One reason that lust begins in your heart, as we said, you've stopped looking at Christ, and the reason you've stopped looking at Jesus is because he has little or no appeal to you. All of a sudden, you're no longer grateful for the sacrifice. All, all of a sudden, uh, you, you don't care. And that's not all of a sudden. You, you slowly, bit by bit, layer of your heart after layer of your heart. Paul says that they've become callous. We read just a second ago, the word is past feeling, where I can't feel anymore. i got a calluses on my hands from from working in fields, and, and you can touch, and, and, and I don't feel that. And that's what our soul is. 
hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I have to enjoy Jesus as a superior satisfaction. What steps have you taken? What have you done? How hard have you fought to enjoy Jesus as pleasures forevermore? I mean, really, how hard have you fought for that? I mean, have you prayed and cried and wept and, and poured yourself into Scripture and poured yourself into spiritual people who can hold you accountable? Have you joined a, have you joined a small group to hold you accountable? Is it, is it, is it too hard for you to, to open up and to be transparent? I pray not. You know, people are getting crowed over by having to wear masks into worship, but I saw something the other day on Facebook that says, y'all been wearing masks to church for a long, long time, well before these paper things came along. <laughs> and I thought, you know what, you're probably right. Why are we so reclused? Why do we not talk and pray for one another? Why do we not confess to one another? As the scriptures say, confessing to one another is not just this one-time thing where we go down front and we've sinned something bad. Oh, well, it's too bad, and I gotta have pray. I gotta have prayer, or somebody knows about it, so I gotta say something public now. That's that's too late. Confession to one another is a an accountability system to your brothers and sisters to say, Christ is most savorable. Do you know what happens when you walk away from the faith? You know what you're telling people? When you commit adultery or fornication and you live in that lifestyle. See, bad things happen, and accidents happen, and, and, and people can come out of that. Absolutely. It's not damned because you've done it. It's damned because you won't get out of it. Restoration can always be. This, this picture here of Jesus is satisfaction. Do the Scriptures burn within you? Do they burn within me? Have you fought for your joy? Have you fought for your joy in Jesus? See, I don't necessarily have to have joy in my spouse to have joy in Jesus. I can't change Missy's heart. That's my wife. I can't change her heart. And I can't make her do. I can't, I can't fix her. Only Jesus can fix her. Only Jesus can can save her heart and save her emotions and save her situation. And the same with me. Missy can't change me. I and you as New Testament Christians are always in the business of changing. We're always growing and looking more and more into the image of Christ. A marriage and a union between two souls that are in love with Jesus will never be boring because they're always changing. They're always, quote, getting better or stronger, as I like to say. I want you to put your eyes on this verse, and I want you to say this to yourself. If you're dabbling with the sin of the flesh of adultery, fornication, or self-pleasure, pornography, Psalm 90 and verse 14, you need to make sure that this is stamped somewhere where you can physically see it. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days satisfy us in the morning. That means when you get up off the bed, when you wake up in the morning, before your feet hit the floor, what you're praying and asking God, Lord, satisfy me today. Not in a, not in a egregious, obsessive, uh, gluttonous way to say, I've got to be pleased. I've got to be pleased. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. God has poured His love out to you. Please let that be satisfactory. Please let His grace be sufficient for you. Please endure. You were created to treasure Christ above all, not fleshly sexual desires. And you know as well as I do, when you've committed that or you've done that, you went down that road, it didn't fix it really didn't fix. The last one is M, A-N-T-H-E-M. Anthem is the word. M is the last letter, which is to move. Move. Move into a useful activity. I grew up here in my whole life. Jake, I, idle hands are the devil's workshop. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I have to move into a useful activity. I've got to place myself in the service of God, get out and do something. If you're, 
if you're positioned, as we said, in, in, in a situation that you know you shouldn't be in, you've tried your best to avoid it, you've said no, you've, you've turned to the promises of Jesus and savored Him, you've, you've held on to those promises and you won't let go and you're not going to give up on those promises that He will satisfy you. And, and you, you uh, preacher, enjoy E, enjoy Jesus as the superior satisfaction you've done all that then move maybe it's a co-worker move jobs get out of that mess go into a place where you can be productive some of you are maybe f flirting with the idea of moving away from your spouse or moving into fornication or maybe moving in with somebody and shacking up with somebody, not being married, when you try to play husband and wife, but you're not. Brethren, I want to beg us to move, to physically move back to God, to move back to God spiritually, to move ourselves into the work of God. If it be, I need to physically move. If I need, if I need to be transparent with my spouse and say, I've got to take another job, and so be it. So be it. Lust grows in the garden of leisure. Brethren, you need to find a good work and put yourself to it. And stay in it. And stay in it. Anthem, we have to fight for this. We've got to fight. We've got to stay out of the, the physical hell we, we, we may think it's pleasurable, but it's not. It's a war. I don't know how people sleep at night. I guess their heart's calloused. I would say that. But, but, you know, the last thing that they would see at night is that fan spinning above their head. And the last thought in their mind is that they're not right with God. You know that they know that. And if you're floating with that, I beg you, please don't. The first thing you'll think of in the morning is that you'll see that ceiling fan just to spinning. And you'll remember that you're not right with God. In the middle of the day, you'll be reminded. You'll see something. You'll be reminded that you're not right. And if you're not, brethren, I'm, I, I, I plead with you to make things right. To make it right. We've got to fight for this. We have to. We've got to fight for what's right. We signed up for this. We signed up for this. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 14, it says that the Lord Jesus has um, purified for himself a people of his own possession. He purified us to make us his own people. Brethren, I pray, I pray that you live in that purity. We know what sin is. We don't, we don't need a crash course on what that is. We know. It's my prayer that you'll cling to it, that you'll run to the cross, that you'll run to... To, to where Jesus is through the scriptures in the church you'll be a part of that it's my prayer brethren may we always give praise to God and arrows to the enemy